What happens when one extreme stellar object just isn't enough for you? Well, welcome to the potentially super extreme world of the Thorn Zhitkov object. Just when you thought the universe couldn't get any stranger, now we have an object that's a mixture of a red giant or super giant star and a neutron star. The universe did just get stranger. Come on, let's go. The Thorn Zhitkov object was hypothesized by Kip Thorn and Anna Zhitkov as far back as 1977. So first let us talk about the two components of the TZO. Red supergiants and neutron stars are actually different phases in the life cycle of a star. Stars are massive balancing acts between the outward force of the energy released by nuclear fusion, trying to blow the star apart, and gravity trying to crush the star down out of existence. This uneasy balance lasts for millions if not billions of years as the star shines. Red giants and red supergiants occur towards the end of a star's life. A star the mass of our own sun would in time become a red giant, but if that star had more than 10 times the mass of our sun, it will become a red supergiant. So why does this happen? When a star uses up the hydrogen fuel in its core, it starts to fuse helium instead. When this happens, the star begins to contract. As it does, the hydrogen in the outer layers of the star heats up to the point where it's now hot enough to begin nuclear fusion. And this causes the outer layers of the star to expand greatly. The star also cools, but this is partly because the heat is now spread out over a much, much larger surface. Red supergiants are really big. Even though their mass may be between 10 and 40 times the mass of the sun, the radius is hundreds, even thousand times that of our sun. Next, let's have a think about neutron stars. Neutron stars are what happens when physics looks the other way for a minute. Stars don't stay in the red supergiant phase for long, only really a few hundred thousands of years. As they shine, they're building up more heavier and heavier elements in their core. This eventually leads to the formation of iron. Iron fusion can't happen, and so this is building up in the core of the star. And once it reaches a certain mass, the core of the star starts to collapse very rapidly. This heats up the core and the implosion rebounds in a stellar explosion known as a supernova. This is actually a type 2 supernova and maybe in the future I'll do a video on the different types of supernovae. This blows off the outer layers of the star. Remember we said that stars are massive balancing acts. The gravity of the remaining matter starts to crush itself. And without the outward force of the nuclear fusion to balance this, gravity crushes the core of the star further and further. The protons and electrons that make up the atoms in the core, and these are usually kept separate in an atom, are now forced together to form neutrons. At the end of all this, we're left with a neutron star. And these have roughly between 1.4 and 4 times the mass of our sun, but in a sphere about 14 kilometers in diameter. These objects are so dense that just 5 cubic centimetres, that's about a teaspoon, would weigh a billion tonnes. That's mountain territory. Neutron stars are also hot, and I mean very hot. Typically the surface of a neutron star is about 600,000 degrees C, and that's compared to a surface temperature of about 5,500 degrees C for a star like our Sun. So why would a red supergiant and a neutron star ever come into contact? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. They could be wandering stars and just happen upon one another randomly. But let's be honest, space is big, and I mean really, really big. The chance of these two objects just simply happening upon one another are vanishingly small. Maybe in crowded globular clusters it's a possibility, but still a remote one. This, however, doesn't mean that a thorn zeitkopf object is never going to come about. Many stars are in fact not single stars, but binary star systems. We've even found planets orbiting binary star systems. These star duets are in fact quite common in the universe. Binary star systems form in the same way that other stars do, from collapsing clouds of gas. But in the case of binary stars, the clouds of gas don't collapse into just one star. That cloud of gas forms two stars orbiting the combined centre of mass. When they form, these binary systems are not going to be completely equal. The mass of the two stars will not be the same. One of the stars will contain more of the mass of the gas cloud than the other. 
and this means that the stars will be different, and they'll evolve differently. They'll also use their hydrogen fuel at different rates. As a result, one of the stars may reach the end of its stellar evolution before the other and become a supernova. As a star explodes, you might expect it to affect its partner star. Supernova explosions are not, however, symmetrical. The explosion could just miss the other star. It would, however, alter the orbit of the neutron star, and this could potentially put it on a collision course with the red supergiant. Alternatively, the two stars could go on orbiting around each other until the non-neutron star itself becomes a red supergiant when it comes towards the end of its life. This would mean that as the new red supergiant expands, it would swallow the neutron star in the process. No matter how it happens, we're now left with a thorn Zhitkov object, but that isn't the end of the story. As we've already seen, red supergiants are truly immense stars, whilst neutron stars in terms of size are at the complete other end of the spectrum. So the red supergiant now contains a neutron star. As a neutron star enters a red supergiant, there's friction between the neutron star and the outer, thinner layers of the red supergiant. The neutron star will spiral in towards the core of the red supergiant in a strange dance that may take a hundred years. When they finally meet, they'll merge. And if the mass of the merged object exceeds a certain limit, it will trigger a supernova, and the resulting two stars will then form into a black hole. So how do we detect these things? Essentially they look just like red supergiants. All the interesting stuff is going on deep within the star. And we can tell a lot about stars by looking at their spectra. Effectively we shine the light from a star through a prism to separate the different colours of the light. Different chemical elements will absorb light of different wavelengths, a bit like a sodium street light that are orange in colour. This allows us to tell which elements are present in a star. In a TZO, we would expect to find more lithium, molybdenum and rubidium than we would in a normal red supergiant. That's because these elements can form in the hot conditions found inside a TZO. We wouldn't expect to find these in the cooler interior of a normal red supergiant. So have we found any of these strange objects? HV2112 found 200,000 light years away in the small Magellanic Cloud looks superficially like a red supergiant star, but the spectral lines of this star contain more lithium, molybdenum and rubidium than would be expected in a normal red supergiant. This was discovered by a team led by Dr Emily Levesque at the University of Colorado. Further studies of this star have cast some doubt on it being a TZO and classify it more likely as a red supergiant coming to the very end of its life. Well, that just about does it for these strange stellar objects, and until next time we take a trip around the weird universe that we live in, thank you very much for watching.